Okay, nobody's okay. Cool. Good morning. I'm actually super excited. You have to watch out here. Something is going on. Um, but I'm super happy. Yesterday was my first formal day at uh, Yellow Park, and it's just nice to have space, to have meeting rooms, to have you know huddle areas, and not as much kind of feel like you're just crammed into a tiny space. Um, I think part of what I was going to say, Marian already said, so <laughs> it will help me help save uh, some time. But I mean, I wouldn't really be here and speak about um, technology and what have you without acknowledging what's happening outside, right? In the economic economic situation that we're in, and what's happening to to many many people out there, many people, uh, all the layoffs and 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 uh, what have you. Unfortunately, it's uh, it's causing a lot of panic and. Um, many people being without jobs, and but it's also, I think, really a time of reflection. When I think about it, I, I reflect over the last uh, nearly twenty years uh, that I, I spent in in tech, uh, or started working in tech, and I, you know, my belief is that since I was a manager for the first time seventeen years ago. What have you? There was so much money. There was it, it was like peacetime in, in tech. Yes, we were competing against each other, uh, the companies. But in terms of money availability, investment after the first financial crisis, the financial crisis of the two thousand and seven and eight, there was so much money, so much opportunity. We didn't really, we haven't spent as much time focusing on how can we be more productive, high performance, and and what are some of the fundamental theories uh, around that. Um, I really believe, I'm a big fan of Jim Collins, and I really believe, and I say it over and over again, and I'll continue repeating, it's all about culture of discipline, and it's three things, discipline, people, thought, and action, right? Um, it's all about having amazing talent, um, having processes where we are able to decide what do we do, what do we not do, and then just going all in and execute, and today I'm particularly focusing on execution, right? That's what I want to uh, focus on. One of my most favorite authors of all time, Don Reinerstein. Anyone know, know him? He wrote a book called, who wrote this book? The Principles, Principles of Product Development Flow. It's one of my most favorite books ever because it's very scientific. It actually discusses queuing theory, batch sizes, and, and how they can, you know, why we ended up with the product development processes we have right now. But this is a super interesting uh, quote. When you read the first time, it's pretty uh, difficult to comprehend, but when you read it a few more times, but basically what it says in essence that, hey, we just got used to the way we do product development and nobody has the appetite to change it. As soon as we try to change something, maybe we fail for the first time. And then instead of continuing, persisting and changing and making it better, we just go back to the old ways we're used to because we fear, you know, Fear pushing, pushing more, and, and and making sure that we can go faster and faster. But this guy, I had the luxury of spending two days in a workshop with him in 2016, and <clears throat> basically he brings it down. I'm not covering the entire book, and you you know by all means, I think it's really a good investment of time. But I want to um, focus on those problems. So he, he highlights these problems where we are blind to cues. We don't know in our product delivery process, where are the queues and what's, what's the state of the queues. There's hostility to variability. We're trying to make sure that we don't do, we don't do big swings, you know, go for a big, uh, big initiatives that might, might disproportionately reward us. I will right, we'll cover that in a second. We have institutionalized by large bat sizes. We're looking at big initiatives. We don't look at, hey, what's the tiny thing we should deliver first, right? <clears throat> We're underutilizing cadence, you know, cadences of, hey, every two weeks, every week, we just push, push something out of the door. And we, we spend so much time, I'm not just referring to Glover, I'm referring generally in our industry, industry we, we spend so much time managing timelines instead, instead of relentlessly visualizing and managing queues, right? When I say queues, it's basically where is work stuck? Is it in this, this step of the process, that step of the process? And remote work hasn't helped this, right? Because there used to be a time when I would work in the office in 2000 and 
12 at hotels.com in London. And you would see boards, you would see where the, where the work is stuck. It's very visual, everybody can see it. And it was very easy to identify, hey, we need some help in, in, on this front because everything gets stuck here. You know, maybe somebody's out, somebody um, has, cert, uh, you know, has finding it difficult to, to work on it. And then we have a profound lack of um, work in progress constraints. We just pull more things, put more things yesterday. Um, I was having a conversation with one of our directors, like we get so many different priorities from so many different things, but it doesn't mean we need to push everything down to engineering teams, right? We need to, we need to restrict and reduce the work in progress that we have right now. So the book generally, uh, and the theories basically um, suggest three things. One, small bad sizes. As in, when you take a task, when you take a task as a team, it shouldn't be the entire initiative, where then you disappear for six or eight weeks just figuring out what you need to do. It's all about, hey, actually, let's figure, focus on a small work item. What do we need to deliver? Rapid feedback, limited work in progress, right? So I want to ask one question, and please raise your hand and then speak if you, I'll translate it to the online community, um, if, you, if, you have, if you have the answer. But what do you think? How much will it cost the company if your team, your engineering team, stops working on their initiatives for one week? For a week, not weeks. For one week, can you estimate how much it will cost in impact of the output to the company if your team stops working for one week? Like, we don't have that metric. We don't, we don't, we don't know. Right? It's, it's super difficult. But wouldn't it be great to have an understanding of, hey, what is the cost of delay of my team not doing the work for one week? And then we can compare. We can compare, hey, what's, um, if we pause this team for three weeks, this initiative for three weeks, um, and ask the team to deliver something else, and compare, you know, what is the, if we knew what is the cost of delay or a particular team in FinTech, sorry for picking on you, a global, not, work, not delivering what they're delivering, but instead switching to another initiative, we could, we could compare and contrast, right? It comes down, it comes down to that. But it is, it is very difficult. Instead, we focus on a lot of different metrics. So cues, why are they bad? Because they are a leading indicator of future cycle time problems. And I have an illustration here that's going to show it very easily. So this is a really cool graph of an airport immigration system where you, know, you can see the beginning uh, of the time um, axis, um, things are fine, the cycle time is zero, so it takes only like a few seconds to go through the passport control. And then a bunch of passengers arrive, right? But only when the passenger number 41 leaves the queue, there is an indication that, hey, shit, the cycle, the cycle time is two times higher than before, right? It's a lagging indicator. It, it takes time to, to, to show us that cycle time is getting, like cycle time is getting back. The bigger indicator is the size of the queue, is, is how many items do you have in your backlog? Right? It's like, th these are the things that we have to manage instead of focusing on, I mean, cycle time is still a you know, really, really good uh, metric, but we need to focus on going back to small batch transfers, rapid feedback, limited work in progress. Um, why are uh, big queues bad? Because they, as I said, uh, they have longer cycle times. If you create an engineering team and give, uh, put a backlog of a queue of you know, 400 items, obviously, as the, from the get-go, it's going to have a very long cycle time. There's increased risk, more variability, more overhead, lower quality, obviously, because you're racing to deliver many different initiatives and, and, and you're going to have to lower the quality to, to get it done. And obviously, less motivation and burnout. I think okay. Marga? So this is a picture of um, Los Angeles on Christmas, around Christmas, uh, when people are racing. And this is what happens to product, uh, product development teams, right? And this is unfortunately what happens to us, to everyone else, where we just pile a lot of initiatives and it goes into all the different queues, cluster queues, engineering team queues, and, 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 and it gets stuck because of many factors of just not visualizing, managing, being very radical about, about queues. I see a lot of smiles. I think it's maybe a reflexive, maybe not, but the clicker doesn't work. So 
So we need to make rapid intervention, interventions, direct interventions to do it. And set Q size maximums, right? Think about, you know, one of the biggest discussions that we keep having all the time is about, hey, you know, uh, we have so many bugs, we have technical debt, uh, we plan to do company OKR work. And then when somebody, another team asks us, hey, we have this dependency on you, sorry, we have no time for it. But I think we have with other, other practices, right? For example, we could do, we could say from every beginning of every, yeah, every iter iteration, we calculate, hey, this iteration, we will, we're going to set aside 20 hours that we're going to spend on supporting other teams, right? We are being very forceful. We put it like 20 hours. And then every time we support one team, we just remove the time from it. And once we hit the limit, we say, sorry, next iteration, we can support you. Uh, what I mean here is that, we, we should be more direct and visualize and figure out where, where, what we do and, and, and how, we, uh, how we support um, support the team. Okay, variability. So generally the thinking is that the, the more you reduce variability and variability here is, do you go from initiatives that look alike? So you continuously deliver similar size work um, initiatives that more or less make similar impact, or should you go for a kind of wide swings of initiatives? You know, you go for delivering something that you know is definitely going to add value versus you go do an experiment that potentially could add, could add 10 times more value. I think over time, we became less um, tolerant to, to risk. And we, again, when, when I'm, I say we are not only say global, generally in the industry, we, as the company grows, as you become more process heavy, you start kind of, Focusing more on driving initiatives, initiatives that are definitely guaranteed to, to, to make money. And before that, you have to do a lot of discovery work, user research that might take six to 12, 12 weeks to con conclude. But the thing is, when you reduce variability, what happens is, I'll show you in a second, but it reduces reward, right? And we'll cover that in a second. So what we need to do is as we deliver, as we look at things, uh, look, look, look at the initiatives that we're de delivering, making more better choices as we look at data, right? How many times have we started working on an initiative? We continue working. We know it's not, I think it's becoming more complex, but we still insist on working on it versus work delivering something else that's going to drive more immediate value uh, quicker, right? Why am I talking about this here? Because as much as we discuss this with man you know, managers and product managers, it needs to be pushed from engineering teams because when all is said and done, you are the people working, working on this and you have to push. Um, on the other side, I think the, the economy right now shows as well that the companies that survive are the ones that are most agile, where people, resources um, are so flexible and shape-shifting that you can just pivot very quickly. You realize, hey, you know what? We wanted to do this thing, but right now the market values profitability. And we're going to change our initiatives very quickly. As you know, at Globo um, in May or June, we decided that to reflect companies' OKRs better, we're going to do a tech rebalancing. Right? We want to make sure that our biggest asset, our tech talent, work on initiatives that are going to drive the most value for Globo. We did it very slowly. Right? It took us all the way until you know, October, November to finally start actioning it. You know, we had a, a team from Contact Cluster that moved to ads and monetization to help drive more profitability and what have you. But then we got stuck because there was the economy tanked. We, had, we have to look at our balance sheets and see how do we make changes. And now we're, we are basically looking at that, but that meant that the implementation took a very long time. So what I'm advocating here, and what if you hear Jeff Bezos always talks about agility, he says, okay, be careful when, if you're a speaker. <laughs> uh, he, he, keeps, you know, uh, he keeps talking about people will copy your ideas. They're going to you know, deliver what you're delivering, but the, the only sustainable uh, thing is agility. You have to make sure that you're, still, you're the most agile company. So that's, that's, that's the idea here. Okay, so what, what's asymmetric payoffs? That's what I was talking about. You know, imagine you have three, uh, three initiatives here. If you, if you opt for re removing the one that only has 50-50 pro uh, probability, right? The first one with an incredible return, 35,000, and you only focus on the ideas that are 
guaranteed to drive value. You're, you're, never, going to, um, you're never going to have something that, where the payoff is far greater. Right? So this is just an idea, but I'm, I'd be really interested if you start thinking about this in a dream team saying, hey, we keep working on those things that are guaranteed, that they, they make 100%, um, you know, 100% sense. But do we actually do enough experiments where we just go completely different direction and say, let's do this. Probability of failure is genuine, genuinely high, but why not try? Maybe we're wrong, right? Especially in cases where we, spend, we tend to spend a lot of time and asking customers, hey, if we de de deliver this, would, would, you, would you use it? And then, and then the person say, well, maybe, you know, I don't know. But instead of that, let's just put it in front of customers, couriers, partners, brands, and see if, um, if, they, if, if they, they might use it because the value of success there will be potentially much higher than, than the cost, little cost of failure. Okay, batch sizes. And I, I think I'm more or less on time, no, five minutes. Uh, so reducing batch sizes is, if, if you, even if you don't do anything else, and I'll show a graph in a second, even if you don't do anything else, if you reduce batch sizes, and batch sizes is work item. If instead of starting at the epic level, if you actually can craft individual small stories or tasks that if delivered individual will add value, you can actually create a lot more uh, a lot more goodwill from your stakeholders, right, peers, uh, by delivering frequently and, and in smaller batches. And they're going to be less expensive, less, ris um, uh, less risky, and produce faster results and faster learning. Right? It's one of the, che like I said, cheapest, simplest, and most powerful way to reduce, um, reduce delivery time. And this is what we're, I know I'm repeating, I have it like three or four uh, slides, the, the, same, the same bullet points, but it's all about small board batch sizes, rapid feedback and limited work in progress. I know oftentimes, you know, over the last eight years, a lot of the industry has all been about, we need to create teams and give them freedom and autonomy and initiatives um, to, to get things done. But the fact is we completely forgot about measuring what success looks like in those cases. I have an, I researched a lot. I speak to a lot of CTOs, to product officers. There are people that I worked with in the past who are, um, you know, um, I worked with the current chief product officer of uh, Waze and we exchanged some information back and forth the other day about, I, I wonder how Waze operates, the engineering teams and what have you. I mean, you would think that Waze that obviously they're all about logistics, you know, metrics, queues, uh, uh, you know, avoiding queues and everything. We failed translating, they failed translating what they're practicing in terms of their, their domain to how they develop software, right? The sentiment was like, even a ways, you know, everything is slow and blocked. We don't, we don't tend to uh, deliver enough value. I think I'm, again, pushing for small batch sizes, small um, things where that, that you continuously, continuously show progress. Here's, here's what it looks like, right? If you say, hey, I'm going to do these, do these things, do this project, two projects, versus I'm going to split the project that we have in many small increments, and I'm going to deliver, deliver, it, deliver, deliver it slowly. This is what it looks like. This is how the stakeholders will feel as well. They will feel continuously, continuously getting something, continuously getting output. And if you continue delighting for your stakeholders, your product managers, your uh, the, the wider, broader business people that work with you, that's, that's what matters. It's very similar to, imagine you're super hungry uh, and somebody tells you the next meal is six hours time and there's no snack, nothing. That, that's what a lot of the stakeholders and a lot of my stakeholders in the past felt like where, uh, hey, you know, actually we're going to deliver in six months time. No, I think it's a much better when you keep giving people something like snacks for <laughs> six months. Uh, and uh, probably it's not as healthy uh, for, for people, but I think for stakeholders, it will be, it will be pretty good. So because it accelerates feedback, like you push something out, you learn uh, much quicker, it reduces risk, reduces cycle time, increases urgency, um, and, um, and when, when, when you're able to, when you find that your team is not committed to something for the next six months, 
it's much easier to shift focus. Right? You can go today from delivering one thing to tomorrow switching your focus to something else. And believe me, it's, it's when you have that going, it's not only good for the company, it's actually good for people in the teams because you get to experience different areas. You get, you get to understand the broad, broader, broader business. And um, last thing I'm going to say, this is the focus. I shared this with uh, a bunch of um, the leaders at Globo, cluster leaders, directors in engineering and product. But what do I think we need to focus on in uh, quarters and, and months and quarters ahead? with regards to um, making sure that in this market we, we are more successful. One is high bar in talent. Like I, I think we're, it is super important that people who come to Glova every day find the high, high bar, the, high, you know, the amazing talent that we have, find similar talent and energy in the office. Right? It, it's the worst thing when, when, you, when you are working in a team or we're working in an environment where it's not your your energy and your yeah you know your the urgency to to do so something great is not reciprocated it's 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 not a good feeling to have so i think this is kind of the top thing that we need to focus on going forward back to basics in processes and tools like i said the first thing reduce work in progress and small batch sizes please like do challenge that and let's make sure we don't have a team of six engineers all working on different industries like that's that's a no go because I think that's the beginning of the Los Angeles Christmas traffic. More fluidity in org design, where depending on business context and priorities, we can immediately shape shift um, to, um, you know, Jurgen Apello has that concept of shape shifting, which I really like. Profound understanding of the business. How do we make money at Global? Right? Ask yourself, um, do you know how Global makes money? If not, then when you are making decisions on day to day, how do you know that we are actually make the right decision? Because understanding what are unit economics, how does Global make money? Starting from your area of Global, you know, whether it's cost per order, whether it's acquisition cost of a of a customer, or you know the uh, acceptance rate of an order on partner side, whatever. But you have to understand the e economics uh, in order to make better better decisions and big impact. Favor cheap learning. Many of the things that we're solving today at Global have been solved in our industry 10 years ago. I can tell you at Hotels.com in 2012, one of my teams was doing type ahead suggestions. And we did one of the best, I think, at the time in the industry, where you would start typing any destination, any landmark. It would immediately suggest the best one based on your context, um, which country you're in, what are the most frequently searched terms, and, and, and what have you, right? 10 years ago, that was solved and Amazon solved it way before that. And we shouldn't be going and discovering and running six months discovery in order to build a type A suggestion. I think we should just go and uh, un, you know, shamefully copy um, and, 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 and uh, take, take those learnings very quickly. And the last thing, it has to be about fun. It has to be about feeling fulfilled. When you come to, come to work, you have to feel that, hey, I feel fulfilled by, learn, uh, by working with amazing talent and by the value we're, we're, we're delivering. And I feel that I can be impactful. I'm not coming here and I just say a lot of things and nobody uh, hears me, nobody gives me the time of day. It has to be about fun, right? And on that note, I'm going to hand it back over to Marianne. Thank you.